Hey everyone, Commander Josh Hawkins here, and at the time of sending you this broadcast, this is the view from my cockpit. Parked just above a small, seemingly unremarkable moon orbiting a Class 1 gas planet about 31,000 light years from Sol. But as I'll get to in just a moment, this little inconspicuous planet may have just saved my life and that of my frozen guest, Commander Shannon Day. My day began just like any other back home, with the normal routine, waking up, stretching while my coffee heats up, and grabbing the ship's status report from the past seven hours to review while using the personal facilities. One of the great things about being over halfway across the galaxy alone in a ship is that you don't have to worry about someone knocking at the bathroom door. Exercise is also a very important part of the routine, since the artificial gravity isn't quite as strong as that of Earth, and you don't want to lose your ability to walk when you finally do decide to go home. So a regular exercise regimen is mandatory in order to maintain proper muscle and bone health, and I usually try to squeeze in about two hours a day of exercise broken into 30 minute intervals. My morning workout also helps me warm up, because it usually takes a little bit for the ship's climate controls to adjust to the daytime operating temperatures. The ASP is a big ship after all, and it would be a waste of energy to heat the entire ship 24 hours a day. After my workout, I grab my breakfast rations and take a seat at the con in order to begin plotting the day's journey. First on the list for today was the routine mapping and scan of a binary moon system I spotted just before closing down navigations last night. Welcome to Exploring the Milky Way Galaxy, Part 12. The small binary pair orbited rather close to a Class M star and had some particularly large mountainous regions with a bright orange hue that merited a closer look. Although normally, rocky moons don't interest me all that much, when they orbit so closely to not just each other but their parent star as well, they present an opportunity for some really amazing sights. The sky in this part of the galaxy, filled with the brightly illuminated dust lanes spanning tens of thousands of light years, makes the sky itself appear to be on fire. I decided to descend onto the dark side of the smaller of the two moons in order to get into position to watch the morning light cast itself across the surface. As I made my way towards the mountain I had spotted from orbit, daylight broke across its highest peaks and the mountain itself became a beacon in the dawn hours on this little moon. Like the call of a siren in the morning light, luring me in with its enchanting beauty and mystic song, I turned towards the monolithic structure. But as my ship approached, an alarm sounded, and my attention was drawn to something I had not seen in over 150 days. A small light flickered on my ship's radar, though no contact registered on my informations panel. Was it my imagination? Or was it my new sensors warning me that they had in fact picked up the signal of a high wake nearby? And just as quickly as it appeared, it was gone. I saw nothing in the sky, and the signal was certainly gone, so I cautiously pushed forward. I continued my survey of the mountain, gathering as much detailed surface information as my scanners could manage. But then there it was again, and this time my sensors were able to resolve the anomaly on the radar and established that there was something out there. The modifications I had made to my sensor array were working, and someone was out there. But how far were they, and did they know that I was here? I couldn't stay here and find out. This planet offered no protection, no places to hide or run. I finished up the survey as quickly as possible, entered the log into my ship's computer and I left immediately and started reviewing my scan data over the past few days for any places that I had visited that could give me a strategic advantage over whoever or whatever was out there lurking in the shadows. But before I could even jump out of the system, there it was again. 
This time, my ship was able to resolve a quick trajectory of the wake, and even though it only flickered for just a moment, it was close and heading in my direction. I had to act fast. With a new nav point set, I charged up the FSD and prepared for hyperspace. I identified a rocky ice moon I had scanned, only 10 light years away, that orbited a class 1 gas giant with a set of metallic rings whose electromagnetic field was over a thousand times stronger than any I'd come across before. My sensors had a hard time locking onto the planet when I scanned it, and I hoped that it might have the same effect on whoever was out there. The moon itself orbited very close to the ring system, and was littered with deep canyons covered in thick layers of jagged ice. With sensors already on the fritz from the strong EM field, it's possible that the canyon walls could further distort the ship's photonic tracking system. Perhaps there would be enough distortion that they might not even be able to see me altogether. But with their wakes appearing closer and closer, it's more likely that whoever this was had some tech on board that was allowing them to scan my wake, and they most likely knew exactly where I was. All I could do now was power up my weapons and pick where the battle would happen. I figured it was only a matter of time now, so I settled on a small plateau with several narrow canyons ahead and waited for them to make their appearance. I'd been waiting several hours when finally... Commander Josh Hawkins, we have come to retrieve the woman and return her to the bubble. Transfer her escape pod to our ship, so we can deliver her home safely to her family. My tactical analysis revealed a full complement of weapons and a powerful shield system. This was no search and rescue ship. It was a predator. Well, that's awful nice of you. Unfortunately, I can't help you out with that. You see, Commander Day is under my protection, and I'm not about to turn her over to you. This doesn't have to get messy. Give us the woman, and you may go on your way. You know, I never really liked bullies or threats, and I don't really like you either. So you can try to take her from me, but I'm sure you've already scanned my ship and saw that I'm fully capable of making a mess of my own. This is your final warning. Okay then, come and get her. And just like that, the game was on. The canyon ahead was wide enough to fit in, but a bit too narrow for their large ship to maneuver properly, and they followed me right in as I hoped they would. The electromagnetic field distortions were working just as I'd hoped, and he couldn't get a lock on my ship, and I had one other big advantage over them. Speed. My scans of the Anaconda showed that while they were packing a lot of firepower, they had to sacrifice their thrusters in order to have enough jump range to make the trip out here in such a short time. Their D-rated thrusters were barely enough to keep them moving, let alone navigate through a narrow canyon but I still had to be careful. Fortunately for me, an outfitting error I made before I left the bubble meant that I was packing two chaff modules instead of heat sinks. And man, did they ever come in handy now.
With a blind corner in the canyon ahead, I took advantage of an opportunity to drop out of line of sight. I pulled back hard on the stick and hit my boost in order to quickly scale the canyon wall unknown to my pursuer. And my tactic worked. The anaconda didn't see my maneuver, and with no target lock, he continued pursuing my ghost around the corner as I brought my ship up and around and into attack position. It was time to see what this ship was made of. Luckily, my big guns were all fixed weapons, and with my combat experience, I had no problem tearing through the Anaconda's shields, and he was just a sitting duck stuck between those canyon walls. His low-rated thrusters gave him no maneuverability, and even if he tried to turn around, I could easily reposition myself for the attack. It was as easy as shooting fish in a barrel. All I had to do was keep him lined up in my crosshairs and keep squeezing the trigger. He tried to run, but I easily outpaced his ship. Module not function. I could have ended the fight right then and there, but if he never made it back to tell them, they wouldn't know what I was capable of, and I wanted to make sure that they got the message loud and clear. As he pulled away and tried to escape the battle, I made sure to do enough damage to his engines that he wouldn't come back. He might be able to limp his way back home to whoever sent him, but he'd be foolish to face me again. A few more shots to those engines and he'd be dead in the water 30,000 light years from home. You better run home and tell your friends what happened here. Let them know that they're next. You tell them Josh Hawkins is coming. Once he was gone, I stowed my weapons and let the ship cool off a bit. I opened my comm channels to see if I could intercept any communication he might make back to his employer and possibly get a clue as to who was behind all this. My receiver was picking up the usual background noise, but there was something else in there as well. He must have been using an encrypted channel because the computer was having a hard time processing the signal. So I applied a few more of the filters I've been working on to clear out some of the noise. And then there it was. Well, looks like he wasn't the only one in the area. An asp and an orca? Sounds more like a trap to me. Time to reload my weapons and prepare my ship for another fight. This is Commander Josh Hawkins, signing off. I hope you enjoyed this installment in the series. If you did, please click the like button and don't forget to subscribe.